I had the privilege of attending James Murray's reading in St. Paul of The Awakened. Our group was especially lucky because even though over 100 tickets were sold for the event, only about 30 people showed up. So it was kind of a more intimate, quiet setting. I love that he's a creative that's wanting to branch out into another form of art. The fact that he has background as a writer and TV producer and he's going full on author. I think that's really cool. So here's um, an expert of his reading in St. Paul. This chapter is untouched from its original form 14 years ago. I think it's the perfect chapter. Um, it is the first chapter. I wrote this as a short story and this, this particular chapter. I sent the short story out to my friend he called me 20 minutes later and said, you've written a book. What is the story around this chapter of a book? I said, I thought about it. I was like, you're right. I should write this as a book. Uh, so I wrote the entire book around this chapter, if you can imagine, with no idea of what was before or after it. I wrote the whole book around this chapter. And in the chapter, you guys know the story of the book. Uh, in, the, in the near future, New York City builds a brand new subway line called the Z Train. Uh, and it's, uh, and they, it's like a super fast, pay, a fast uh, bullet train, if you will. Underneath the East River, they build an underwater visitor's pavilion, like glass steel. It's like the hub. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. It's like the hub where all the trains meet. Um, the inaugural run of the train, uh, the, uh, on the train itself is uh, the mayor's wife, 100 lucky New Yorkers. In the pavilion is the mayor, the president, press covering the event. When the train rolls into the pavilion, all the passengers are missing. The cars are covered in blood, and the windows are shattered out. So that's how the book begins, right? So in this chapter, uh, all hell breaks loose in the pavilion was there's a terrorist attack, what's going on. Uh, so in this chapter, uh, two, two cops are walking in the pitch black tunnels that are filled with methane gas, which is highly toxic to humans. Uh, they're walking through the tunnels with gas masks on, trying to get to the point in the tunnel, the pitch black tunnels, where the train, they lost contact with the train and it, they don't know what happened. So they're seeing if there's terrorism, what's going on. They're, these cops are walking on foot ahead of the SWAT teams and our uh, special forces to do, do a little secret reconnaissance. Uh, so here you go, you ready guys? What page are we on? We're on page 48, the bottom. Right. Okay, everybody ready? Let me see, I wonder if this is... Where is behind it? Hello, hello. Does that even work? There's nothing, right? Yeah. Nothing, hello? No, no, it doesn't. Is it any better, any better, right? No. Okay. Let's see, is that, that's definitely better. Yes. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, oh. <laughs> is that, that, that's definitely better for people, yeah? Yes. All right, good, okay. <laughs> Test it, just, okay, good, that's much better. Okay, uh, okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm a bald guy, these lights are no good. Okay, ready? <laughs> okay, thank you. Hair, that's what I need, not that. <laughs> Officer, officers Jim Donaldson and Carl Bradshaw crept silently down the Jersey City Tunnel wearing gas masks. The dim orange glow of the emergency lighting illuminated their, uh, illuminated their path and they rounded a shallow bend that led toward the pavilion. They could barely see three feet in front of them in the darkened tunnel but they didn't dare use the powerful flashlights on their belts. If there were, were terrorists still here, the cops didn't want to alert them of their presence. Donaldson was in front, careful to avoid their subway tracks in case the power returned and they transformed into a death trap. Muniz had given them clear instructions not to use their weapons or, excuse me, or engage the terrorists to put the search for survivors and the source of the gas leak. It made him feel like bait, especially as it descended into a choking atmosphere. They pushed deeper, closing in on the halfway point. Domson stopped mid-stride. What the hell? A few feet to his front, rubble, rubble surrounded a gaping hole that descended into an unknown darkness. No idea what caused this, Bradshaw said, but it doesn't look good. No shit. Bradshaw pressed his back against the tunnel wall and edged to the side of the hole. He flicked it back on, aimed the beam downward, and speared into the dark, dusty air. Donaldson grabbed a rock from a pile of rubble and tossed it downward. 
No sound returns. I'm no geologist, he said, but that ain't supposed to happen, is it? Call it in. Brenshaw unclipped the walkie-talkie from his belt to press the transmit button and pulled away the lower end of his gas mask. Diego, the speaker, sorry. Diego, we found part of the problem. The speaker let out a static squelch. Go ahead, Carl. We've been working 118. It looks like the railroad ties buckled out of the track. There's a, a pretty deep hole. We don't know how far down it goes. You get that? Bradshaw asked. Roger, is the track still intact? It's bent upward and on both sides of the hole. The track hasn't ripped off the ties entirely. Is there any way you can block in or fill the hole? Now let's send down a backhoe and a shit ton of dirt. Any signs of life? None. In that case, you and Jim pull back, return to the station, keep your weapons holstered, and stay alert. Understood. The men turned to retreat, and Bradshaw's shoe made a squishing sound. He looked down to examine the tracks and gasped. What the? We're standing in a goddamn pool of blood, he nearly gagged. And what's that on the floor? Is that? Bradshaw leaned down to get a closer look. Severed digits. Bradshaw stumbled back in shock, nearly tripping over his own feet. The walkie-talkie slipped from his hands and plunged into the abyss. Damn it! Bradshaw yelled futilely. That's the least of our concerns, Donaldson snapped, snapped back. Let's get out of here. The officers retreated up the tunnel. At the, at the next marker, the walkie-talkie on Donaldson's belt crackled. He ignored it and continued until it chirped twice more, as if somebody on the same channel had double-tapped the transmit button. Come on, Bradshaw said. Keep up. Donaldson unclipped his walkie-talkie. Wait, you hear that? No. It sounds like a... I'm not sure, something. Donaldson slowly walked back in the direction of the hole. The crackling cleared, and in the faintest regions of all the concernment, he, he thought he heard a voice calling out. He drew closer. The speaker hissed, followed by a, a whisper, a child's whisper. It sounds like a, a kid, Donaldson said. Both men froze, silently waiting for another transmission. Help me, a little girl said more clearly through the speaker. Donaldson pried away his gas mask and raised his walkie-talkie. What's your name? Help me, she repeated. You're not hearing this, Diego? Donaldson asked. Just hearing you. What's going on? Donaldson didn't answer as he took in the situation. He knew he wasn't imagining things because Carl definitely heard her voice too. And since her voice became clearer when they neared the damaged part of the tunnel, he was pretty sure a passenger had Bradshaw's walkie-talkie that fell into the hole. Donaldson sprinted for the hole. We're lifting his walkie-talkie. We have a passenger alive, a little girl, may need medical assistance. We're going back, over. Negative, Munoz replied to the speaker. Return to perimeter, immediately. To hell with that. There's a kid down there. Donaldson skidded to a halt by the marker post and flipped open one of the MTA emergency boxes lining the tunnel. He grabbed a basic medical pack, an unhooked coil of orange rope, and an LED lantern. Bradshaw knelt by the hole and raised his gas mask again. Sweetheart, can you hear me? Help me, came through the walkie-talkie. We're coming, Donaldson yelled. Carl, tie this end to the track. Are you nuts? You can't go down there. Hell, you don't know how far down that goes. Aren't you prepared to leave that kid to die? Donaldson tore off his jacket and slipped on a pair of gloves. We have to at least try. Tie the goddamn rope, Carl. Bradshaw hesitated for just a moment before he secured an end to the track. Donaldson cast the other end into the abyss. He wrapped the rope around his gloved hand, latched a lantern onto his belt, and passed Bradshaw his walkie-talkie. Keep moving in the loop. And be careful with the walkie-talkie this time. You got it. Donaldson planted his feet, leaned back, and lowered himself downward into the pitch-black shaft. The dim, orange light from the swinging lantern bounced off the walls. He descended slowly, careful to avoid brushing against the jagged edges of rock. You see anything yet? Bradshaw called. Not yet! The chef narrowed toward an opening, and he had 20 feet to go. Sweetheart, Donaldson said. I'm almost there. Can you hear me? Help me. Echoed from below. Help me. Hearing the little girl's voice directly for the first time struck him as odd. 
It sounded the same every time, like, like a talking doll. He paused to catch his breath and listened more intently. Suddenly, the rock snapped below his boots and gave way. He plummeted a dozen feet, crashing against the sides of the shaft. Sharp outcrops tore to his left side. His, he clamped his hands around the rope to stop his slide. Dirt and rock rained down on him, showering to his eyes, battering the top of his head and shoulders. The light from his lantern, the light from his lantern, cut out. He clamped, <coughs> sorry. Donaldson winced as strength drained from his body. The rope slipped between his fingers. He plunged over the opening and braced himself braced himself for the moment of impact. He braced himself for the moment of impact. His boots crashed against solid ground sooner than he expected. Pain seared his left ankle and he collapsed in a heap over a pile of rubble. <coughs> Donaldson coughed. He shook the lantern and tapped its side. It flickered back on and he held it in the dusty air, illuminating the walls and ceiling of a small cavern. The points of sharp stalactites hung down from the ceiling, making it impossible to stand if he wanted to search the place, but he had just enough room to crawl. Jim! Bradshaw's voice echoed from above. Jim, can you hear me? I'll live, but I... I think I broke my ankle. Do you see the little girl? Something rustled in the darkness. Sweetie, is that you? Donaldson asked. Are you hurt? Help me. Darling, head toward the light. I'm here to help you. Don't be scared. I'm a police officer. Donaldson crawled through the opening and entered a tighter space where the stalactites scraped along his back. His lungs burned and his ankle throbbed, but his determination to save that little girl drove him on. His hand hit something soft, and he lifted a child's tattered and blood-stained white dress. My God, sweetie, I'm coming. There's no need to be afraid. A figure darted across his front. He extended his lantern inched closer to the dark corner and toward the sound of the girl's coarse breaths. Reach for my hand, honey. Dawson's shirt snagged and slapped tight. He lowered the lantern and reached back to free his shirt. In his peripheral vision, a figure lunged at him with no room to maneuver. There was nothing he could do. His hands grabbed his shoulders, nails pierced his flesh, and his body lifted in one sudden movement. The glistening ends of two stalactites exploded the center of his chest and stomach and held him in air. Blood spurted from his mouth and his vision blurred. Jim! Bradshaw screamed at the distance. Jim, are you there? Through the darkness, a snarling face appeared below Donaldson's torn open torso. A scaly hand lifted Bradshaw's walkie-talkie and a dirty fingernail hit the transmit button. Help me. Not terrorists was the last thing that went through Donaldson's mind before the scaly hands choked the little life he had left out of his throat.